Good afternoon and welcome to our keynote address uh, featuring our uh, second Darcy lecturer. Uh, and indeed, we are privileged uh, to uh, present uh, Tom Prickett as our uh, second uh, uh, year uh, Darcy lecturer for 1988. Tom is uh, presently uh, uh, going to be presenting the practical aspects of groundwater modeling, which is uh, shown on the screen. And uh, this is the uh, topic that he has presented uh, to uh, uh, students and faculty and other interested parties uh, at uh, 16 universities this year around the country, uh, serving in the capacity as the Darcy Lecturer for our organization. Uh, his lecture tour, of course, has been rather extensive. It is published uh, in the newsletter, so we won't take the time to uh, go through all of the various universities. But uh, Tom uh, did meet with our group and had indicated that uh, he enjoyed visiting with the many students, which was one of the major goals of the Darcy program. Uh, and in that process, was able to convey to them uh, some of the uh, real world aspects of uh, modeling and uh, was able to uh, uh, bring a closer liaison between uh, the professional world and those students. Before he actually begins, however, I would like to uh, briefly talk about some of his uh, background. He's certainly very well known and doesn't, uh, this needs to be relatively brief as a result, but I will uh, comment that uh, he uh, received his uh, degree in engine, uh, engineering from the University of Illinois in 1969. Uh, he uh, uh, worked for the Illinois State uh, Water Survey where he developed the uh, Prickett Lonquist, or what now is called Plasm, as well as the random walk models, of which he now is uh, using in his everyday practice and alluding to in this uh, particular series of presentations. He uh, formed his own uh, firm in 1981 and is uh, continuing to uh, pursue that endeavor. Tom has also served on the Association of Groundwater Scientists and Engineers uh, Board of Directors from 1982 to 1984, and he received the National Water Well Science Award in 1977. And I'm proud to say that he's also a colleague of mine as a uh, adjunct professor of geology at Oklahoma State University. With uh, no further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to you, Tom, and uh, let you get underway. Thank you, Doug, and it's certainly a pleasure uh, to be here and talk to you about uh, my lectures uh, during the last years. Uh, one thing I want to make clear is that uh, I chose a subject that's pertinent to the students, and so the professional people will kind of roll along with me. I'm not lecturing you, but I'm, uh, I'm talking about a lecture that I gave to the students. Uh, the gist of, of it is that you, you may be very good at handling differential equations, and the theoretical aspects of groundwater modeling, but there are many stumbling blocks in between you and a successful application of these modeling techniques in the real, uh, real world. So what I wanted to talk to the students about was some of those practical aspects that can get in your way uh, along the way to uh, ap applying these models. So with that uh, background, I'll, I'll go through uh, the lecture uh, that I've given at those uh, many universities. Uh, for those of you who might be looking at, at your watch in here, this lasts from 45 to 50 minutes, uh, depending upon how turned on I, I get uh, in here, and uh, so that you can uh, uh, be ready uh, or to see how long this thing is going to go. All right, uh, let me get a little organized here. I've got an outline uh, here, and uh, it comes in three parts. Uh, number one, going to uh, warm up my laser uh, as it goes here. Here we go. Uh, I'll have an introduction to let you know where I'm coming from uh, and how many years I've spent in this business. And then I'm going to uh, uh, introduce a lot of the problems uh, via case histories. Uh, then somewhere in here, I'm going to give a summary, which will have to do with these four subjects, people, time, and money, litigation experience, uh, process definitions, and some good news. Uh, so this is the general uh, gist of what I'm uh, going to do. Uh, 
let me start off with an introduction to give you some sort of an idea of what I mean uh, by this uh, modeling of business and how much time I've spent in each uh, area. Uh, here is uh, a flow chart which shows a typical uh, modeling approach. And it goes from uh, field studies down through conceptualizing what's going on in the field, uh, uh, down through uh, selecting some sort of a solution technique to answer what if questions uh, that you've generated in the field, uh, following on uh, then to putting a flow model uh, together. Uh, which drives a contaminant transport uh, model in here. Uh, finally getting down to a validation and a predictive phase in here, which is in fact what we're up to uh, doing. You have a problem at the beginning, you want to solve it and make some predictions in the future, so this is the name of the game. Uh, the first maybe three or four years of my uh, background uh, was at the Illinois State Water Survey, and these first two uh, areas up in here. A lot of field studies conceptualizing what's going on and writing reports uh, about those. Uh, as, as this normally occurs, uh, conceptual modeling is very valid uh, in that experience in working with the field data in here. Uh, we'll give you some sort of an idea of what might happen tomorrow, but tomorrow based upon what you've done or observed today. Uh, there are loops uh, back here uh, to gather more field data to improve your conceptual uh, modeling. Uh, uh, quite frequently this loop uh, uh, goes uh, in conjunction with discussions with uh, a lot of agencies, permitting agencies. Uh, after a while, the uh, conceptual model uh, becomes uh, complicated to the extent that you're thinking about auto automating uh, what it is that you're observing and, and probably getting to a, uh, position to make some organized um, predictions uh, into the future, given certain what-if questions. In which case, uh, you would fall uh, down through this flow chart into the solution technique choice of what kind of uh, computer program, what kind of device you're going to use to organize this and, and uh, create your uh, solutions. I, uh, I spent about 10 years at the Illinois Water Survey uh, in that solution technique uh, area. Um, once the organizational process is chosen, and today the most popular uh, item is to use a computer to help you organize and answer the what-if questions, uh, the first thing you, you get into is application of putting together some sort of a flow model. The flow model, uh, upon completion and uh, uh, calibrating and verifying what it is that you're working with in the field, then is the main driver for telling where the pollutants or the contaminants are going to go. So these things uh, come together and of course there are loops back up to the field to collect data as you get organized and you figure out what's going on. Uh, of course as the contaminant transport model is put together there's a loop back to uh, give you some sort of a, a, of a more refined uh, answer as to what you're doing uh, in the flow models. Now this is what I've been doing in the last about 10 years of my uh, career. Uh, there's a validation step in here after calibrating to field uh, uh, data, there's a validation uh, step in here. And quite frequently, that has to do with maybe what I'll call the split sample uh, routine. You take half your data to calibrate uh, your model to field conditions, and then you take the remaining half and make a prediction of that using your model and then some sort of uh, statistical analysis of that difference gives you an idea how valid your model is to uh, predict uh, what's going on in the field. And once that validation step is done, it's a free game within the constraints of what you validated and calibrated uh, to make a prediction uh, into the future. Quite a few of the uh, errors uh, that are made with models have to do with going out of bounds in their predictions compared to what you had from the field data or what you validated uh, here. So that there's a lot of uh, problems with predicting uh, with a model that hasn't been validated. Okay, uh, three or four years in the field, 10 years in the solution techniques, and the last uh, 11 uh, years uh, in the applications. All right, let me just uh, for a moment uh, go to, uh, before I get into the modeling case histories, to say something about the uh, solution 
uh, techniques, which is in the, in the center here. Uh, here's a slide that shows a generalization of the type of models that are used today. And I've got them in groups of conceptual uh, formulas, uh, numerical techniques using a computer, and miscellaneous techniques here. Uh, it, I, I want to emphasize uh, that modeling is more than just using a computer and dimming the lights in whatever city that you're working in, is that the conceptual model is, is valid. And that I've, uh, 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 I've listed here with and without experience because it's been uh, my experience uh, that there are many people who have misconcepts of what's going on in terms of groundwater modeling or in terms of just general groundwater uh, flow and mass transport and that in applying these models you've got to deal with both people that have experience and those that don't have experience so be ready uh, to deal with both of those people. Our formulas are terrific particularly for homogeneous isotropic conditions when you have very little uh, data uh, numerical uh, techniques, which uh, come in various um, varieties, finite differences, elements, and some miscellaneous uh, techniques, uh, one of which is a random walk technique, which I've uh, had uh, some experience uh, with putting models together myself. So these, in general, are the types of models that are, are used, and in not all cases do you have to uh, have a computer uh, involved uh, in these predictive uh, tools. Let me go on and talk in terms of case histories that uh, bring up several stumbling blocks in the applications of any of those models uh, to uh, successful predicting of uh, groundwater maybe impacts in the future. Uh, this uh, first case history has several uh, lessons and I'll probably dwell on this one uh, the longest out of, out of all of the ones that I've got uh, during this uh, lecture. This is uh, an area which is uh, four miles by six miles inside. So each of these squares, and here's a square mile, and there's a cooling uh, reservoir in here, which is uh, cooling water for electric generating uh, plant in here that's using uh, coal as their power uh, source. Uh, the problem was getting a permit uh, for an ash lagoon, which is located right next to the uh, reservoir here in this mile and a half square uh, area. There would be an ash lagoon in there that would be some 50 feet tall by a mile and a half square. The concern was boron uh, leaching uh, downward, uh, getting into a sand and gravel uh, aquifer of glacial origin, which would eventually uh, flow in the groundwater path uh, southward uh, to this uh, river here, and it would flow off the bottom of the map, which is the U.S.-Canada uh, border. I was hired uh, by the Saskatchewan Power Corporation to aid in getting a permit uh, for that uh, ash lagoon uh, that's in there. Now, uh, one of the first lessons uh, that I've learned in the consulting business is that when you, when you get involved in these kind of uh, projects, you're going to, first of all, be presented with uh, a database which is less uh, than adequate. And not only that, you'll be presented with a timing or a budget that is less than what you'd, you'd ordinarily like. Uh, and that was true in this particular case. And all of the data uh, for this particular problem was mostly, about 90% was right where the ash lagoons uh, were going to be. And it was very, very little up gradient and down gradient of that particular area. Uh, the timing in here, as you'll see later, was a little, uh, a little close. I was uh, asked to come and visit the area and uh, make certain I wanted to be involved in this uh, study, uh, put together a groundwater model, prepare written and oral testimony uh, before uh, the permitting uh, agencies. And in this particular case, there was international uh, implications. Uh, and given all of that, uh, produce uh, that report and the oral testimony in a period of four weeks. So things were a little, a little tight, and this is uh, one of the application problems that most everybody gets uh, uh, between a rock and a hard place uh, in and applying these models. Okay, um, uh, let me show you uh, what the area looks like and what was uh, some of the other problems. Uh, there's uh, the cooling lake, and there's a cooling channel right along uh, the edge of the ash lagoons and you'll go into the field, and this is what I saw in my first um, 
a trip uh, there. It's almost like a foreign country. It takes about 16 hours to get from Champaign-Urbana, Illinois, to this place. And uh, here I began to sense uh, the urgency of all of this. Uh, actually, the, uh, here's the cooling channel. The reservoir is off beyond the right-hand part of the screen. And here is the ash lagoon uh, being built. Uh, there's uh, no permit uh, at this moment. This is a levee, and it's about 10 or 15 feet uh, high. Um, as it turned out, I'll uh, give you a, a preview, is that they did get their ash lagoon. It looked like a pretty good spot uh, to have an ash lagoon of this nature. Uh, in here. Uh, so uh, I went, uh, they got their permit. I went back after they put this into service, and here is an after uh, photograph, same position, uh, showing the full size of the ash lagoons, and it's full of, uh, well, nearly full of water here. And there's about 45 feet of head difference between here and the water surface there. And uh, one item that I tell the students is that if, always in, in putting one of these models together, on using maps and things of this sort, there's always a shock is to see it when it's actually built. And when you make predictions about leakings uh, out of the bottom of these ash lagoons, and then you go view these things in the, uh, in the real world, there's always going to be a time when you get a lump in your throat and you lose a little sleep. And I'm about three days is what it cost me on this. <laughs> Uh, I jumped in a Jeep and started a, a, a field trip around the outside of this looking for leaks. Um, I, I said, put, stop the Jeep here. Uh, here we're down on the cooling channel. Uh, th this fellow is from Environmental Canada here and we're looking at this entire bank uh, in here that's sloughing off uh, into the cooling uh, channel. Now it's this sort of thing that gives you lumps in your throat. Uh, as it turned out, well, uh, it was right in a section where there were uh, monitor wells, nested monitor wells, right across uh, this thing. And about two days later, it was determined that this was not groundwater seepage, which could be in danger of this whole embankment uh, here, but it was, it was surface water uh, problems that was uh, causing this instability. Uh, they've turned the pumps on at the electric generating plant, and cooling water would rush down here, and this surface water uh, elevation uh, stage would change uh, drastically and was the ultimate cause of that sort of thing. But the lesson here is to be ready uh, to uh, pay the dues in your designs uh, uh, when they finally are, are put into a uh, real operation. Uh, up on the top of the lagoons here, and the lesson here has to do with the popularity of groundwater uh, today. Everybody is looking very closely at your work, and in, on occasion they're not looking closely at somebody else's work. And here's a couple of items uh, that uh, appeared to me. Uh, I thought the wind blew in Oklahoma, but southern Saskatchewan, it really uh, roars at times. And you can see the coal pile uh, here that's, well, it's rapidly moving south, uh, going across the border. And they're worrying about one and a half liters per second of leakings out of the bottom of this mile and a half uh, ash lagoon. Uh, there should have been some more attention given to that. Uh, in addition, there was a pipe that was used to drain these uh, uh, lagoons, if necessary, uh, that had some sort of an ill-defined uh, uh, construction feature to it that actually washed out. Uh, so this, uh, this finishing pond here, which is about a half a square mile, uh, washed out that pipe, and that whole slug of 40, 50 feet of, of full of water went into the cooling channel and across the spillway, across the border in one gulp. Uh, so that they're looking closely at groundwater, they may uh, uh, better uh, look closely at some of the other, uh, other things. Uh, here is a, uh, a, is a shot of the grid that I used uh, in, in putting a model uh, together. It's a uniform gridded uh, model, a quarter mile on a side, and there had been some field studies in here talking about this empress aquifer that was in that area that was capable of putting some sort of boundaries on there. Uh, Canada-US border down here, and you can see the uh, cooling uh, reservoir here, and 12 uh, small dots, which uh, were essentially the only data that could be used to calibrate and validate uh, this uh, particular model. 
Now, in that particular area, uh, the, there are certain uncertainty in the, the predictions that you're uh, making with using such a small uh, database. So, uh, uh, despite uh, that, uh, the, uh, uh, the materials, the situation in that area uh, was um, at least favorable for, for putting one of these uh, ash lagoons uh, in there. Uh, despite the predictions, it showed uh, that it looked like a pretty good spot. There, you should be aware that uh, there are a group of people that would like to have you look at some uh, mitigative uh, schemes just in case. And so that all of this modeling business uh, it should be expected uh, to have some sort of a scope of work in there that would, uh, that would uh, help mitigate any uh, problems if they so uh, came up. And uh, this is an output of the computer model showing a purge well system uh, in that area up there just in case the leak inside of the bottom of that ash lagoon uh, was undesirable. Uh, you're looking at the outline uh, these letters represent certain elevations of water levels. That particular map came right off the printer of the computer, and of, of which these contours in here are contours of the letters, or in fact, contours of the water level elevations. And there was some very simple uh, flow net analysis in here showing some capture uh, zones of, of some purge wells in there that gave at least the permitting people some confidence that if things got out of hand, some sort of a standard purge system uh, might be applied to capture undesirable uh, water. So mitigative schemes, despite all your well good intentions of impact analysis, are part of the part of the game. Uh, I took this job on on one basis that I would be able to put together a monitoring plan. Uh, when this thing went into effect to make sure that in the future things actually uh, went as well as we had predicted them. Uh, that was part of my uh, contract and they probably think twice about it later because I put 136 uh, monitoring points uh, on that uh, up in the Canadian side and I don't, I've forgotten how many are in the United States right across the boundary. Uh, incidentally, there are people uh, that sometimes forget about surface water uh, connections. So there's a great deal of surface water monitoring going on in there. These S's are part of it. The water level in these uh, ash lagoons uh, is easy to forget, but uh, in this particular case, I didn't let them uh, forget that. Plus nested wells, both up gradient and down gradient, and all of those square miles are involved. Uh, despite all of this monitoring, despite all of the well thinking, there were some things that came uh, that were unexpected by anybody. And one thing was the loading due to put, you put 40 to 50 feet of water over a mile and a half square uh, on the aquifer in that particular area. The water levels uh, fluctuate uh, rapidly as you load this uh, thing. And it gives the appearance that there's a lot of leakings uh, coming uh, from the ash lagoon that really is a compressive uh, characteristic of the situation. So there was another two or three days uh, lumps in the throat until that was uh, worked out. So the, all the best minds uh, working on these things there are uh, problems that can crop up that nobody uh, thinks about. Uh, here's a next case history, which main theme is uh, things may be complex, but look around for these simple, obvious things, which may uh, help you uh, solve a large part of your problems uh, without the use of a large computer model. Uh, this is an iron mine in southern Spain. Uh, we're about two miles back uh, from the its open pit. Uh, this is a couple hundred feet uh, tall waste a pile. Right here is a conveyor belt that is dumping the waste, uh, causing quite a stir in the uh, atmosphere around there. So we think about some of our problems. They've got their share of environmental uh, problems uh, as well. Uh, the houses are covered with this dust and their cars and their clothes and what have you. Uh, that. Uh, uh, asked to turn off the conveyor so we can go up and look uh, at uh, the situation. And the next slide uh, is there. These uh, piles are a couple hundred feet or so. There's some Spanish uh, engineers here looking at that particular area. Uh, right uh, behind that is the beginning of either the third or fourth largest uh, open pit mine in the world. Um, 
Here is the thing that they wanted to avoid. Uh, there's some erosion off to the side. There's alluvium over the top of limestone uh, here. And they wanted to increase the rate of mining without getting this sort of thing uh, uh, going. Uh, there's a lot of groundwater uh, in the area, both in the alluvium and in the uh, limestone. And right uh, down here is a yellow uh, pump house uh, that has been used to dewater uh, this uh, area. And there's several of these things around over the years that that mine uh, has been there. In this particular case, these people were uh, tooled up uh, right at the beginning to keep records of pumpage and water level decline. And so they had enormous database as to what was going on in here. There weren't, weren't a great deal of uh, surprises uh, to be dealt with. Uh, I'm going to pan a left here to give you a little idea of what the situation is. Uh, here's the uh, full size, a mile or so across uh, here, uh, 800 feet uh, deep. There's a conveyor belt uh, taking the waste uh, up. Uh, another dewatering uh, well here, uh, panning left. Uh, here's the face that's being mined, some more dewatering wells, and if, uh, if your eyes were good, you could see some dewatering wells in the overburden alluvium uh, off in the background. Uh, the last pan to the left and shows what problem is coming up. Uh, this mountain range back in here, uh, in front of it is a river. They're getting closer to this river and induced infiltration uh, will be picking up uh, very shortly, uh, creating uh, some additional water that they haven't dealt with uh, in the past. So the problem is, is to how many wells and what their depth and pumping rates are going to be. To keep this, uh, this is the face which is uh, moving uh, towards those mountains, keep that uh, stable. Uh, as it turns out, it's with their database that is there. Uh, there's some uh, three-dimensional uh, models that are of uh, concern, but well, I, I suppose uh, one of the obvious concerns is getting more wells uh, in there, and the more uh, the better, and that's uh, particularly going on uh, here. Uh, here is the obvious uh, one problem uh, area that came to, to light, and one in doing this modeling business might be uh, keeping their eyes out for this sort of thing. Uh, wells in the alluvium in here, their discharge is going down this drainage uh, ditch. As a matter of fact, it's going uh, downstream to uh, a recharge uh, pit uh, that will help some other people a few miles away with some of their water supplies. And uh, come to find out uh, that a uh, a survey of the loss of the water upstream and downstream showed that there was 100% of total recirculation uh, in there. So lining of that uh, pit, or I mean lining of that ditch was certainly in order of uh, just conceptually uh, uh, modeling that sort of thing, that total recirculation uh, should be uh, stopped. Uh, as a matter of fact, the next slide shows the recharge pit, which is totally dry. Uh, <laughs> On to another uh, subject, having to do with the general way models are development, developed and put in uh, to use. Um, it goes like this. Uh, a researcher uh, does a basic chemistry and physics, uh, writes a report, writes the basic equations of flow. Thereupon, a model builder grabs a hold of that and automates uh, that with some sort of a computer program. Uh, and writes a user's manual, which is eventually put to use by some technical expert who is a solving a problem for a real manager uh, in the field. Uh, quite typically, the researchers of a federal, state agency, national laboratory, university uh, group. Model builder, uh, usually uh, with the uh, researcher, uh, a computer uh, people that can automate those sort of things. Uh, the technical expert quite typically is the uh, groundwater uh, consultant, and the manager then is the land fill owner, uh, the uh, well field operator, city engineer, something of this sort. Now what, uh, what happens here is that there's a problem right between this technical expert and the manager. And the, and the problem is education. The manager quite frequently doesn't know groundwater uh, at all, and he's faced with solving a problem. And it's the technical expert that tries to help him uh, through that. Uh, the researcher and the model builder are, are a little remote uh, from that. I spent maybe 17 years up in this uh, area uh, in here, and that's quite uh, honestly a pretty plushy 
uh, place uh, to be. Uh, when you get very close to the people writing the check uh, down here, things get a little, a little tight. Uh, so I've, I, being in the consulting uh, uh, business, uh, there's always this educational problem. Is what you're doing could be triple integrals or differential equations have to be explained in some sort of a straightforward technique to people who have the real problems. Otherwise, there's communications uh, problems, and in which case uh, a lot of hard feelings are uh, developed. So things as simple as showing a manager how a cone of depression uh, starts and how it involves uh, um, um, areas of diversion and what have you. Here's a uh, graphics uh, chart of a single well in a bounded aquifer and over a period of time these cones of depression uh, grow with time. A very simple type explanation is not going to uh, confuse anybody or certainly uh, are called for. Uh, this uh, cone of depression uh, grows and what have you in a series of these contour maps. Uh, one thing that I've found is that there's a large number of people who can't understand a contour map. Uh, so the 3D fishnet of this contour may be of some help uh, in explaining uh, to these people uh, what's going on. Uh, the graphics is very, very uh, useful in this educational uh, process. Spray irrigation buildup in a uh, situation in uh, central Florida. Uh, the 3D fishnet of the same sort of thing. People who know nothing about groundwater can follow along uh, with these sort of things. Uh, here's uh, the uh, water table at the city of uh, Fort Lauderdale, taken from, over, um, uh, from a position over the ocean. Uh, water levels near the ocean, uh, ridges in here are groundwater, uh, recharged by induced infiltration from uh, canals. Uh, the, uh, the dips in here are well fields. Here's a well field, Pompano Beach, uh, north of Fort Lauderdale, that's pulling water levels down below the uh, sea level, causing saltwater uh, intrusion. Recharge areas, conservation area uh, in the background. Uh, you have to be careful with reports that contain an awful lot of this sort of thing. You want to make sure that although this educational uh, process, you're not dealing with a used car dealer uh, in here too, is you're getting uh, these flashy uh, outputs, you have to be uh, backed up uh, by the, the numerical calculations uh, somewhere else. Going south down the coast is the same um, water table map uh, taken from a different angle. Uh, then the, the next shot is uh, go down underneath here and look, uh, get down in the groundwater and look up underneath. And uh, you can see some of the uh, well fields with their drawdowns uh, there. I, um, I have, uh, in the last maybe two or three years, I've spent a great deal of time with attorneys. Uh, and some of their thoughts are, are a little, are coming at it from a different angle uh, than uh, what, what us technocrats sometimes get involved with. And here's a little history about one uh, get together I had with an attorney. Uh, this is a slide of the, uh, the screen of an IBM PC. Um, on there, so I've, uh, I've do some, I was doing a preliminary study on geographic overlays for courtroom presentation. Uh, you're looking at, these are mile markers in here. There's a road going diagonally. Here's a stream and a, a lake. There's some buildings over here. A couple of red dots uh, there, which were two pollution uh, indicated uh, monitor wells for which they were interested. Where did the pollutants that are in those wells come from? And here's a suspected uh, area over here that had been uh, uh, spraying some pesticides. Um, uh, this uh, model is a random walk technique, which you're able to uh, look at the motion of the pollutants uh, in a groundwater field which is transparent uh, to you. And you watch uh, marker particles go from time to time, uh, from place to place, as you take snapshots uh, in the movement of that plume. So I'll do a series here. And you'll notice the, uh, uh, the pollutants, which was assumed to come from the, that particular area now, are moving in the groundwater field, which is transparent uh, to you. Uh, some uh, scooting uh, off in this particular uh, area here. And so that uh, you can follow these, 
in these sequences to see what the extent of that uh, plume uh, looks like. Uh, here's a position that I stopped and I was talking to the attorney about. I have uh, a number up here, it's 1449, is the number of particles that represent this plume. If you had 10 times that many, you'd get more definition of where this plume is. But you could draw some sort of an envelope around the outside of that to get an extent of the plume and say something about uh, this source and its plume and say something about these wells, which were obviously in the path of motion. And uh, uh, the lawyer says, you know, this is, uh, this is exactly what we need, except what I'd like to have you do is to run this thing backwards. So that here's the plume and its extent. Let's run this backwards so that we can point our finger at industry A or industry B as to the culprit uh, in here. And then I, I went into some sort of a lecture about uh, dispersion is a one-way deal. You start off here and you run this thing backwards and the plume doesn't get smaller, it gets bigger. And uh, the traditional way is the trial and error uh, procedure. You, you, you estimate where the source is and you run this forward in time and if it doesn't match with the stuff in the field, you go back and do this again. And he, right in the middle of that, he says, hold, hold it, cricket. He says, all I want you to do is to run these slides backwards. <laughs> so, I said, don't give me all that other stuff. So I said, okay, give me 15 minutes and I will go and rewrite these code, or this code so I can run it backwards. Uh, so up here in the corner, there's FB question mark. And I've just, uh, that's forward or backward. So I press the letter B now, here is the plume. Where did that come from? I'm going backwards. This thing is coming right back to this guy. Not this guy over here, but it's this guy. So this is what the, uh, the, what the, the jury uh, sees. So there are different things that people uh, look at in what you're uh, doing. Some of them can be very, very simple and enlightening. I learned a lot uh, from that attorney, by the way. A word about computational uh, devices. I've got them from the simplest to the most complex here. And I have all of these uh, in my uh, arsenal of tools. Uh, hand calculations, back of the envelope sort of thing. Programmable calculators sitting on my desk. I carry one in my briefcase uh, all of the time. Desktop uh, computers. Uh, mini computers and then at the top here is the full size uh, computers. In general, I grab the one that is appropriate uh, for the modeling uh, at hand and, and leave the overkill uh, off of the agenda. And I, I, I couldn't help but notice in, in many uh, applications today that people jump to this full size computer all too frequently and have a lot of overkill. Uh, going on in uh, this modeling uh, business. It's not only expensive, it might be even time consuming uh, in, the, in the particular uh, process. Uh, there's uh, many occasions that one of these lower level devices in the modeling process is, is uh, entirely uh, adequate for your job. Now I, I can't uh, help but uh, uh, agree that there are cases where what I'll call audience impact uh, is important. Uh, but to pick the full-size computer to solve Tice equation or something of this sort is going a little uh, beyond uh, reason. Uh, here's what I do 90% of my work on uh, in my office. I have a compact uh, 386 machine here and everything that you can hang on it, including a CAD system, the laser printer, and color this, and uh, a plotter, uh, that. Uh, probably $15,000 worth of equipment will do 90% of my problems. Uh, the other uh, 10 or 5 percent is done through terminals like this to the computers at the University of, uh, of Illinois. When the people want the speed, uh, uh, mainly, the capacity is just as great in some of these uh, desktops as there are at the, at the main university. You know, 3D is the rage of the day. Uh, it seems as though uh, there are even groups that are requiring that you must do uh, three-dimensional uh, models. Here's a 3D finite element uh, technique uh, for California 
uh, set up. Uh, the, it's like a layered cake uh, in here. Each layer is a mirror image of what's above it or below it. Uh, the uh, problem here uh, is, is related to, uh, I suppose, the vertical to horizontal exaggeration and the fact that most of the 3D is really occurring at the source or at the sinks. And in most cases, uh, two-dimensional, with some sort of a three-dimensional transform where it's really important, uh, combinational type models are more efficient uh, than the fully, what I might call, a third dimension uh, type of models. Uh, my experience is probably a one out of five uh, models requires uh, the third uh, dimension. At this moment, there's maybe a little overkill uh, in these particular uh, areas. Uh, plotting the cross sections in undistorted or unexaggerated horizontal and vertical scales is a good clue to uh, helping uh, that matter a little bit. Uh, there are cases where you just cannot uh, avoid that sort of thing. And uh, in those cases, uh, you have to take it into account. Uh, for instance, here's a, uh, here's a golf course in uh, Vero Beach, uh, uh, Florida, and they want to put a spray irrigate uh, sewage, a treated sewage effluent on the greens over here. And uh, the problem is uh, I had a client on the other side of this drainage canal and here was worried about his, his uh, uh, the well field becoming contaminated uh, maybe by some undesirable water. It wasn't uh, sure, for sure uh, what the undesirable waters were going to be, but he hired me to look at possible flow of these waters on this side uh, past this canal into his well field on the other side uh, here. In this particular case, the third dimension couldn't be uh, couldn't be avoided. Uh, some pumping tests uh, were put together looking at the third dimension uh, flow in that uh, particular area, developing uh, some data and water table uh, maps in that area to calibrate uh, the uh, models at hand. Uh, as it turned out, some six layer uh, model was put together, of which case the, uh, uh, the, the various uh, potentials, the various water table maps were produced uh, for each of those layers, looking at this, uh, this flow. Uh, here is a result of uh, looking at the top layer of one of those 3D models, and you can see this canal uh, coming down in here, intersecting with another canal which goes to the ocean uh, here. A uh, buildup water, of water on the east side here at that golf course, and the flow at the water table going to that uh, canal uh, was the result of that. So, uh, uh, yes, uh, the water at the water table would flow to this uh, canal in here, but not necessarily uh, with depth. Uh, here, uh, 150 feet uh, below that surface is another layer which is outputted uh, of a potentiometric surface map that looks like this. Now in this case, this is more of a subdued replica of the land surface, and it's more difficult to see what is uh, happening in this area. In general, the water is flowing down and out, uh, out the bottom of this. But uh, a clear view is put together by putting the previous two slides on top of one another. And this is the superposition uh, slide here. Uh, in this particular case, uh, you look very closely along this uh, a canal in here. You can see the water levels with depths are higher than the canal, so that there's upward drainage uh, in here. The key here is if you draw yourself a flow line, right? In this particular area, here is water that's flowing across and underneath the canal and into my client's uh, area uh, in here. So this picture in itself showed to the attorneys in that case, uh, brought a judgment of this guy against him, which was settled uh, out of court. Now that sort of uh, a 3D type of a situation is, uh, is necessary in that particular case, but not all cases. Uh, the 3D uh, mass transport is just a nightmare. Uh, although it's, uh, it's done uh, every once in a while, uh, it can be very, very expensive, data intensive, and uh, uh, dim, dim the lights in any computer around. Uh, here's a, uh, a building that had been leaking some undesirable waters, and in this case is the TCE. And here is the first layer down with the TCE plume on a perched uh, aquifer. Uh, uh, directly beneath that, is an intermediate uh, aquifer for which its plume is shown uh, here. Not only is the flow third dimensional, but so is the mass transport. Uh, finally, with some depth in here, the plume is getting smaller 
uh, with uh, the TCE looking like that uh, with depth. Uh, incidentally, that, uh, the graphics there come from Golden Software, which is a $400 package that can uh, uh, very cheaply uh, map those uh, sort of things, uh, with the exception of the coloring of the contours, which was done uh, by hand. Oh, this is, I have some relation in West Virginia. Uh, there's a state park down there called Prickett's Fort, and I wish I had that a little closer to Illinois when the, particularly the lawyers jump on me. I'd like to jump in there and uh, take refuge. Uh, here we are, the last uh, four slides uh, in this uh, lecture. And I've got a slide each on these down in here. Let me take people, time, and money and quickly go through that in a summary uh, fashion, some of which you've already heard about, some of you haven't. People, time, and money. Uh, client consult agency relationships, data deficiencies, no time, no money, and a problem with what I'll call computer jocks. Uh, up at the top, uh, the consultant quite frequently is hired by a, a client who has certain goals uh, in what he's going to do, and, and the consultant client does that work and presents it to an agency which may be not totally different, but somewhat uh, different. So in applying these models, this argument, these discussions continually uh, have to be uh, addressed to, uh, to get out from between this rock and a hard place. Uh, data deficiencies is something that always people will argue uh, about, and it's a matter it's, uh, of demonstrating uh, when it is sufficient uh, to agencies and to the clients. Uh, the, that argument will uh, never uh, end. Uh, no time and no money is, I've already talked about that. Uh, the computer uh, jocks down in here, it goes like this. Uh, you, there are people uh, that operate these computers, and computers are relatively new, and uh, there are people that actually live inside that machine. Uh, these are the guys that uh, uh, you, you, you see them in the morning and say, how you doing? And they'll look up at you with a glassy eye and they'll say, relative to what? Or, or they'll, you'll have a computer program which has been perfectly working for the last two months, and one day you go in there and it doesn't work, and you spend six hours trying to find out what's the matter, and finally you figure out somebody's changed the statement, and the jock says, well, of course, I fixed that last night. Uh, <laughs> there, these people are all over the, over the place. And there's one thing that I've learned, is that you have to identify uh, these people as it go goes on. If they're more interested in what's inside the machine, you certainly need these people. Uh, they're, they're fine people, but my, my uh, experience is you never put these people in the critical path. Uh, they'll, they'll get you every time. Litigation uh, experiences. 90% uh, preparation, uh, KISS is the so-called, I've heard it all over this country, is keep it simple, stupid. Uh, if you get complicated and you start talking about the differential equations will do it, uh, for instance, the judge uh, goes to sleep, the jury get glassy-eyed look on them and off to the side uh, they go. So that, uh, at least in that area, uh, the uh, attorneys have it uh, certainly right in arguing it, uh, in juries and judges. You have to keep it uh, simple and boil it down to its uh, simple uh, elements or there'll be uh, trouble. Uh, attorney uh, interviews. Uh, quite frequently you go and visit the attorney and he interviews uh, you as to whether you're good enough for his, his job or your demeanor is right, your credentials and so on and so forth. And then they'll jump up and start walking out the door. And I was in my early days uh, observing uh, this, but later on, I've been able to say, hold it. Uh, what experience do you have in trying these sort of uh, cases? And they get a little defensive uh, themselves. So I interview uh, them and find out what their background uh, is in groundwater. I ask one, <laughs> one attorney, I said, do you know Darcy's Law? And the guy says, no, and I don't want to know it. And uh, so uh, there are cases when things get tight and the arguments go back and forth and that if your lawyer doesn't know what's going on, you're going to stand a greater chance of losing that case than if somebody's got some interest in what you're doing and uh, has had some experience in that. So I, I'm saying just hold on, let's see what the attorney's uh, experience uh, is in that.
Uh, some don't. Uh, about half of my uh, cases have been settled by catching the opposition in becoming a, both an advocate and selecting data for their clients. And once that you find people that have actually taken and left data in their desk drawer that show the opposite of what they're going for, they're completely dead and exposed uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the courtroom. And that's more prevalent uh, than uh, what most people uh, think. And becoming an advocate, getting emotional about uh, what it is that you're doing or you're saving the environment and so on and so forth is another area. If you can show bias, by becoming an advocate, that's another signal that you're on uh, weak uh, standing. Uh, process definition difficulties. It seems like I've listed five. There are actually more, but these arguments and discussions come up repeatedly with discussions with clients, uh, with uh, uh, permitting agencies and arguments in court. Uh, having to do with source characterization, plume characterization, chemical reactions going on in there, biological activity, and choosing model calibration targets. Uh, number one is that all the plumes that you uh, are predicting their movement and what have you have to do with some sort of a source which produced those pl plumes in the first case. And in most cases, uh, the data uh, to show uh, what those characters are are awfully uh, weak. So there's continual discussion about what the character of that source is. And this is, I know there's some data, a lot of reports in the field about this, but that's certainly an area that needs uh, more work on. Uh, plume characterization as well. Sometimes the plume is well defined and the next day you take uh, uh, measurements and it's twinkling like, uh, like Christmas uh, uh, lights on a Christmas tree. It goes and comes and it's not a smooth uh, function. And uh, there are in information and data in the uh, literature that needs uh, help in that particular area. Uh, chemical uh, reactions, I think we're on square two there. There's a lot that has been done. Uh, the biological activity is uh, still back in uh, square one, and, and from what I've observed and the data that I've looked at, that is a very large uh, one that needs to work on. Uh, the final one is model calibration uh, targets. In here, if I have a saying that goes, if you know where you're going, it's easier to get there. So at the beginning, if somebody can define what the scope and the goals are of your modeling exercise, it's easy to hit that target. But it's amazing the number of times that people cannot sit down and define what it is that you're doing. So the, the case uh, comes up at the end, of one of those general no guess again uh, routines is a problem which I'm trying to address by talking about model calibration targets. If you can pick them, it makes your job uh, easier uh, to do. I'm saying of the you know, saturated and unsaturated flow of regimes and, and all of that, uh, particularly the source characterization and the plume characterizations. Uh, dispersion uh, is not uh, on that. I don't know why that is. I'm ready just in case uh, uh, those arguments uh, come up, but that's not one of the top uh, five. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's an important uh, aspect, but it didn't make my uh, top five list. Here's the last uh, slide in here, is that this is good, good news. Uh, allows a complex problem solving, modeling uh, methods are available to most, forces the staff to organize, and uh, the new computers coming up are just terrific in terms of speed and graphics. Uh, going back uh, here, there's just no doubt about it. If you've got a problem, is that there's some means of studying that thing with the, the computer. Uh, capabilities uh, that we've got uh, today. And it's not just in, in, in uh, uh, selected uh, laboratories either. Everybody's got uh, computers available to them, so that's, these methods are available. It may take some difficult times to figure out what somebody else has done, but at least the methods are available uh, to most. Uh, and it's a miraculous, uh, forces the staff to organize. You get surface water people here, the environmental people here, the remedial action, uh, the impact study people together, and they have to organize or glaring inconsistencies uh, show up uh, in the modeling uh, uh, business. And finally, forthcoming uh, speed and graphics is uh, I'm fortunate enough that the University of Illinois is one of these computer supercomputing uh, centers and what I've seen 
uh, there, which probably five to ten years from now will be on your desk, is just utterly incredible in terms of the speed and the graphics capabilities where you'll be able to design and watch uh, purge well systems clean up uh, 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 plumes, uh, design pumping well systems, moving the wells in here, and all the contour maps and the fishnet diagrams are immediately or very closely to that available uh, for uh, your inspection. So that is uh, some of the upcoming uh, action that is exciting uh, to me. And with that and all the ideas that I've uh, put together, I'd just uh, like to uh, thank you. And this uh, last year has been a, it's been more than an experience, it's been an adventure. So uh, with that, I'd like to uh, entertain any questions or thank you for listening. <laughs> I, these, I know these uh, lights are a little bright, but I, can we turn on some lights for the audience to uh, take, a, take a look? Yes. Okay, there's, there's two, two areas, and if I can repeat that, is what do you do about the lack of uh, data? <clears throat> uh, number one, there's a lot to be said for uh, super sensitivity analysis. Everybody wants to know what degree of uncertainty you've got to deal with, and a sensitivity analysis is one of the main ways of getting at that. Uh, the traditional way in my routine is to pick the best engineering judgment uh, parameters and then, uh, then at least test all significant contributions above and below those numbers to display which one of those things are sensitive and which ones are, are not, and how much. And if you do enough of those sensitivity analysis, you can actually statistically look at the probabilities of occurrences of these sort of things. Now that's, you're, you're not learning anything, you're just displaying. Uh, this and the real learning process comes by demanding that a, a proper monitoring system follow along with these uh, predictions. So you know the real king in all of this is the data. So if you don't have it now and you've done your statistical analysis, have some sort of a monitoring plan uh, firmly in place so that you can keep track as time goes on in the future. Yes. I'd just like to ask a question with regard to the second or third slide. You have a very nice shot down the levee. You can show the reservoir on the right hand side, the canal on the left hand side, and more or less evenly spaced or irregularly spaced, at least down the side of the canal, that is the left side of the canal, the left side of the levee looking down on the right side of the canal, there were appeared to be a number of slumps of material that slid off into the canal. You didn't mention anything about that. I've seen that as a sign of failure and leakage in the past in the situation. Well, uh, to repeat what he said, he, uh, some of the early slides I'm going to have to go back and, and look at those. He said showed some uh, signs of maybe erosion, whether it's surface or groundwater is a question uh, uh, here. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I didn't notice uh, at that particular time, and uh, it, as this has been going on for, I think, uh, six or seven years uh, now, there's been no failure of that type uh, in there. But I'll, I'm going to go back and, uh, and look, because I didn't see those at that time. Yeah, in many cases, you know, it's every time I, I, you make these predictions, you, you're, I'm, I'm being facetious, I mean, you make the predictions after your retirement age, so you don't have to deal with this, but uh, it, uh, things do move uh, pr fairly rapidly. I, I know groundwater is slow, but uh, they do, they do move, and I, I'm going to look at that one, but nothing that I know of has happened uh, since then. Well, okay. Uh, once again, thank you very much for that experience. I appreciate it very much.
Thank you, Tom, very much for that fine presentation. And at this time, I would like to ask Warren Wood to uh, come up here. Uh, he is the uh, chairman of the uh, Darcy Committee for our organization. And uh, Warren. Well, Tom, I might even use a microphone. I'm going to say nothing, but thank you very much on behalf of the organization. We'd like you to have this plaque. And I know you gave infinite dollars worth, and all we can do is thank you. Well, thank you thank, very much. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate it. Oh, all right. For the formal photograph. 